thank you very much for having me and it's so great to be able to be uh, sharing some of the things that I've learned along the way. I wish so badly that I would be here in South Africa with you, but my heart's definitely with you. You have been um, following the live stream. That's it too, because obviously I don't look like FKA Tix and I don't move like her, but I do have pretty pictures in my presentation. So I will share my screen and um, hope that it all goes well. There we go. So thank you very much again for having me. As Danny introduced, the session is called Access from the Perspective of Global Opportunities. Um, it would be a very practical session where I try to distill the ways I understand entering into an international market, the different steps that we can take, and also what are the pointers and tips along the way that I thought, if only someone told me this when I started. So I'll first start with an introduction of what MIF is. Um, a background of what I did before MIF and then really go into the five steps that I think are necessary when we look at the access to global market and then the last bit will be a sharing on what I think are some of the skills and qualities that would be necessary when you work internationally and actually thinking about it it would be in your own work and world as well and last of all there will be a Q&A session so do whatsapp me questions um i don't see it on my phone but there will be some magic relaying so i'll be able to hear it so as danny um introduced we are the manchester international festival i deliberately updated this powerpoint deck after i heard the introduction this morning to show uh, the work that we've done with FK Turks in MI15, the work is actually called with us and actually to explore the multidisciplinary work that she does, not only as a musician, but as, as a director, choreographer, dancer and artist. So that really explains what MIF does. MIF is actually the world's first um, biannual festival that is multi-art form and we only show new commissions. So this work is an MIF 17 work with uh, New Order and Liam Gillick. It's called So It Goes. And so, as you can see, we marry different art forms together. We'd see things in a multi-dimensional point of view. The work that we do started in 2007, um, and it started because the Manchester City Council did the Commonwealth game and then thought, actually, all cities and places really do benefit by having an international presence and having an international festival can showcase the brilliant work that not only local artists do, but also bring in the international synergy and energy into the city and really give us a boost and motivation that we all need. And so um, the other thing that we do is also we tour. So this is a work tree of codes that has been touring around the world since 2015. Uh, I am currently working on a tour right now of tree of codes. And this show is actually with um, choreographer Wayne McGregor, um, artist Oliver Eliasson, and the music, musician Jamie XX from the XX. The interesting thing about MIF also is that apart from presenting shows in Manchester, actually more people around the world has seen the work of Manchester International Festival than in Manchester. Very recently, we brought a show called Poet Slash Artist to Denmark. And more than 4.8 million people saw the presentations around the whole of Denmark. Um, the Danish presenter collaborated with the outdoor advertising firm JC Deco, and we plastered all over Denmark works of Manchester, international and Danish artists around the whole country, not only city. And that's why it has such a wide reach. The next exciting step of MIF is that actually by next year, we'll be operating a new cultural complex called The Factory. It will be one of the biggest cultural complex of its kind. Um, it's uh, designed by Rem Koolhaas, um, international renowned architect, and it would have a really exciting and flexible space. In total, 
it can be three spaces, but also one space. So we have a large warehouse space that has a capacity of 5,000 people. There's an auditorium that has a capacity of around 1,600 to 1,800 people. But the exciting thing is actually these spaces can be connected. So you might be sitting in an auditorium watching what you think is a traditional proscenium stage theater. And suddenly the wall will disappear and it opens up into the warehouse. The other interesting thing about the factory is that you can also divide the spaces into three spaces and at any one time, all the spaces can be used. You can have a rehearsal in one space, you can have a gig in the other, and then you can have other workshops in the third. The other thing is we also have public spaces in the outdoors. So you see we're at the riverside, which is really lovely. We have a sheltered outdoor space where, because Manchester always have brilliant weather that boasts of brilliant sunshine, uh, mostly wind and rain actually, like right now. Um, but at any kind of given weather, we can always have things. So this is an exciting thing that's happening with MIF and the factory next year. So a bit of what I've done before, I was the head of touring at the International Department of MIF. I worked at a place called the West Kowloon Cultural District in Hong Kong, where we were building a cultural district around 40 hectares of land. So this is a recent photo of how the district looks like. Um, it has two museums currently, two performing arts centres and 23 hectares of public open space. And when I was there, I was a programmer, presenter, and also worked on some of the policies around how we use the space, how we program the space, and a relationship with the different stakeholders, including local and international artists, presenters, um, our local community, audiences from Hong Kong, China, and international, and also all the different art forms. As you can see, we're in an integrated district. Uh, the exact opposite of what Rafa did yesterday, um, I tend to say that I compensate with my 148 centimeters height with working with mega cultural complexes. So I have to compensate with doing that. And so I would say that my international background come from both the presenter side, where I'm presenting international programs, the artistic development side, where I work with local artists and plan with them, how do you do your international strategy and explore your work outside of your locality? And also as head of touring at MIF, where we work on international relations, both on a strategic level and also in a project by project level, and also in a longer term understanding between different festivals and cultural districts. And so distilling um, a few things that I've learned along the way, I think the first thing is to have a more strategic and coordinated approach on how you understand your global market and why you want to go global. It's very easy to say, oh, I want to be international because it sounds exciting. But to be successful in your global entry strategy, you have to understand what is your goal. So what do you want to achieve from being go global? Is it your branding? You want to expand it? Is it about money? Are you looking for new inspiration, collaboration? Are you looking to scale up? Um, you have to identify this primary goal, but be open to synergies. Because if you just remember that, oh, I'm only doing this for the money, you forget what the other opportunities that can bring you with working with global markets and collaborators. The second is, uh, what are you actually bringing to the global market? Are you bringing a product? Are you bringing a service? Are you licensing things? Or are you bringing yourself as an artist and with your thoughts? Be specific and understand actually as a first step, what can you offer? Be very clear about it because if you are not, you can easily get lost along the way. The third thing is, where do you want to go and why? Do your market research. Where are your audiences and what can each market give you? Each of the different markets can provide different synergies. Some might be great in giving you um, understanding into a specific culture that you've been researching on. The others, they might be able to give you the opportunities to scale up and do things in a bigger manner than you want to. So really think about what do you want to go? What do you want to do? What are you bringing? Where do you want to go? And then the last bit, understand what are your resources? 
So what can you invest? It's not only about money, it's also about time. And especially if you're working as a solo entrepreneurial artist, your own energy, time, resources. So really think about it and your goal setting step one. The step two is research. So do your research on actually what you need to do when you go into the global market. The first is network, tap into the people around you and be sensitive and open-minded about what actually is a network. It might be friends of friends, it might be LinkedIn. I've received loads of messages from LinkedIn saying, I actually want to know more about this particular subject. Can we have a chat? So really understand who can help you in this. The second research is understand the essential needs and the desired traits of your market. So the essential needs govern the hardware, like the legal regulations, um, the censorship, the trade deals, things that you have to abide by when you go somewhere, visa application forms. The desired traits are things that you think the market would want and prefer. Do your market research, understand the market gap, see what you can bring in as a unique value proposition, which is the last part I'll talk about, um, and then enter the market, understand what your market is. Next thing, very importantly, is that your research has to be timely. You have to understand the global trends. The global trends would really dictate how your market will move in the next short time horizon. It can be three to five years. Some, especially in the arts industry, some of the other industries would take longer if you deal with like energy and things. But in the arts, say for example, um, sustainability, which you will be talking about after lunch today, is a really hot topic right now. What Rafa talked about yesterday about inclusivity, that's also something that everyone is talking about. We're also talking about rep representation. We're often also talking about working more with the local community, but not losing the international vision. So these are some of the global trends. So do your research. Um, and the next thing is understand your competitors and collaborators. Um, in the arts, I always see that it's mostly collaborators because we tend to synergize and be able to do more when you're collaborating, but also understand what else is already there in the market. So say, for example, if you're a fashion designer and you originally want to pitch your brand in a certain niche of an audience, understand who else is operating in this. You might be competing, but there also might be synergies. So understand who is there, do your research. The last part is value proposition. So this is to understand the unique value that you bring into a market. You can do it in two ways. The first is to understand your audiences. So what do they want from your product? What kind of pains do they want to relieve? What kind of gains do they want to get from using your product, services, seeing your show? And then you can map it to what you did in the first step, understanding your product or yourself. What can you bring to relieve some of the pain? What can you value at to make it make uh, ex expand the gain that they can do? And so understanding yourself, doing your research and be prepared for the next step. The next step is to understand the mode of access. Um, because as I spoke on the first step, you are bringing in different things into the market. You want to um, have different relationships with the market. So you have to find the best fit for purpose opportunities to enter the market. So say for example, if um, Danny, Daniel said, oh, um, residency, the FKA takes it. If you bring yourself as an international artist into a market, if you want to get new inspiration, maybe residencies would work. But if you're pitching a show, maybe residencies could work, but it would be slower maybe going to performing arts markets, going to big gallery shows, that would work better. Also understand from your network, which is step two, the research bit, what are the local organizations around you and your network who can already help you? So do you have galleries who are representing you? Are there people that you think, oh, actually, they can be a gateway to help me access the market in a safer way? So understand what you're bringing, what you're trying to do, 
and then identify the best way to go into the market. Uh, and the next thing is to value add your experience. So after you've understood how you will be entering the market, how do you synergize and ensure that you're making most out of the experience? So say for example, um, um, I actually came to Manchester for the first time because I got a fellowship to do a secondment in Manchester. During that time, I managed to meet a lot of local artists who are working in Manchester. And so I used that chance to understand and talk to the different artists about, oh, actually, what do you think is missing? What do you think you, what energizes you about Manchester? And from that knowledge, I bring it to the work right now that I'm doing. So that when I talk to international partners and when I'm telling them about how exciting Manchester is, I also draw from these experiences. So use your mode of access to help you add to your own value and to form your value proposition so that what you're bringing is more unique and you can value add to it. So that's step three. Step four is strategic planning. It seems like a long, long period of time and it's only now that we talk about strategic planning it's because i think if you've done your research if you're clear with your objectives you know who you can talk to who you're helping who can help you and how you're entering the market then you can form a solid strategic plan into understanding implementation plans so when are you delivering yourself your product your service or whatever it is um, is there a specific time that is perfect? When I mean specific time, it means internal and external. External, it might be meat market research sets, actually the festival season of this specific area is summer. So by going to a specific, say, Europe, the European continent in summer, you'll be meeting a lot of festival directors. But if you go during Christmas, no one would be there. So these are external things, but also look at your own internal timing of delivery, because always remember you're balancing the external and the internal. What works for you? Are there specific things, commitment, say, for example, you have a big commission going on with a local festival. Can you commit the time to be away from the city that you are in for a long period of time to really invest in going global? So determine your timing of delivery. That's very important. The second point is determine risk mitigation, exit strategy, and potential synergies. So a lot of times we think of risk mitigation as contingency. But again, look at it from an external and internal point of view. Um, for external, there are models that you can use, such as the PESL model. So PESL is P-E-S-T-L-E. And it stands for looking at the political, the economic, the sociological, the technological, the legal and environmental impact that might help, but also it might be risky for you to enter into a global market. So these are the external factors. The PESL model is quite good in giving an overview. So say, for example, if, in, um, if right now you want to work in Eastern Europe, and you think about, oh, what are the potential challenges? The political situation right now is uncertain because of the war. Economically, the whole global financial system is uh, uh, the economic downturn is global. Sociologically, what are the impact and implications? Um, so really think about it from an overview. But also, as I said, risk mitigation comes internally as well. So you can do a SWOT analysis for that, that strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And of course, the SWOT model can work with both external and internal. But for the SWOT model, I think using it as to understand what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, and then look at who can help you. Go back to your research stage, who are the networks, and what are your resources. So with these two, your risk mitigation strategy would be more coherent and more solid. Next thing is exit strategy. And exit strategy is not only for, oh, when something goes wrong, I have to run away. But it's also for when you've achieved a goal, when you've achieved what you went into the international market for, what are your plans after that? Are there any synergies that you can link to to continue that relationship? 
or after you've achieved that goal, is that market no longer something that you're interested in? How do you leave with a legacy, especially in an artistic sense? Uh, what do you want to do and how do you, how do you leave a place gracefully, elegantly? So that's the kind of understanding of the exit strategy and the potential strategies, um, potential synergies. Good with time. Um, and then the last step is implement. Um, I think in this stage, and actually throughout the whole step, the biggest thing is to enjoy. Um, you have to enjoy the implementation. If not, it will, it, it's a very big undertaking going international. Enjoy it because no matter what happens, the experience is yours and you have to own the experience and take what is positive from it. Um, implement and adapt because with all the research and understanding and strategizing, when you go on the ground, you have to adapt to the instinctive um, immediate environment. So you have to be very careful in doing small tweaks. Say, for example, when you're doing marketing um, taglines, some of the language or, or, or words that you use might not float too well in a certain country. Tweak it a little. So it's an adaptation process when you go to a global market. I think in the implementation stage, a very important point is review and evaluate. And it should really happen at each step of going, going global. Um, you have to measure your success and failures, map out the lessons learned to make informed decisions for your next step. Because as artists, individuals, entrepreneurs, um, you don't stop. We always continue on. And going global is not the be all and end all. Going global should be the thing that informs you of this is where I want to go next. This is what I can do better or to inform yourself of this is actually what I like or this is actually something I don't like. So use this whole process and experience, review it to make informed decisions about what you want to do next. Understand how much of your primary objectives did you achieve in the first step? After you've clarified your objectives, understand how much of it have you achieved, but also review back and see how much of the initial objectives has changed. And then you can review, actually, along the way, these are the things that I've learned. I reprioritize things, and this is what I feel is important to me now. Um, the other thing that I find really interesting is after you've went global, after an uh, experience of working with different people, you would realize that you yourself have changed, or maybe through the adaptation, you realize that the product and services that you're providing also change. Record it down. Make sure that you have a good portfolio so that the next time you go out, it's easier, it's faster, you can be more flexible and adaptable. Also, how, does, how did your perception of a certain market change? And how does that influence your future strategies of working with the global market. Understand, again, what you need to work on to make yourself better and make your next step easier, happier, and better. And after the implementation stage, I would say go back to step one, review your, clarify your objectives, and start from the beginning with uh, added um, experience, understanding, and knowledge. Um, as a last slide, I'm good with time, uh, I've just distilled a few things that I find is very important when you go global. And also, these are some of the things that I think are important actually with working in the arts, working in business. It can be um, sort of guiding principles and skills and qualities that I think are necessary. So when I say guiding principles, these are the things, the big pictures, the things that I always remember. And these are the, this is the vision and vigilance. Vision is the big picture. So what are you trying to achieve? What changes, you trying, what changes are you trying to make? What is it that really motivates you when you wake up? But the next thing is vigilance. And these are the small details because the devil is always in the detail. What are the things that can make or break you? Read the small print in the contract terms. Understand your finances. Really understand rules and regulations. And I think when you are able to balance the big picture and 
really be aware of the small details, this guiding principle can help protect you in your journey of going, going global. Uh, the other things are some of the qualities that I think are useful in um, our everyday work. So these include creativity, tenacity, authenticity, and joviality. So creativity, we're all working in the arts and creative industry. And it's, I feel creativity is not only when you're creating an art piece or doing a performance, but creativity and problem solving. And creativity really looks at how you understand uh, an issue, how you change your perspective around understanding an issue, and then using a creative manner to respond to something or create something. So I think that quality as artists and entrepreneurs, it's innate in you. So you look inside and use that. The second is tenacity. This is how, how, how strongly you can hold on to something. Um, I often say sometimes when you go into a relationship or partnership, or when you pitch something to a certain presenter, the answer might be no. But you ask yourself, is it a forever no? Why are they saying no? Is it because of your work? Or is it actually about what I mentioned just now, uh, wider situations like right now, politically, it doesn't work because um, we are in an unstable time or economically everyone, or it's COVID, it's, we can't travel. So no's does not always, are, are not necessarily forever no's. So be tenacious in what you're doing. Um, the third and fourth, uh, be authentic and have joy, um, because I think, you know, life's tough. You have to have fun. And as um, the previous session thing, I said, be integral to yourself. Know who you are. Along the way, do not lie to yourself, because your life is yours, your experience is yours. So you have to be authentic. The next two things are we have time. soft skills and hard skills. So soft skills, I think, are things that you can pick up along the way. So these include research skills, observation skills, communication skills, and negotiation skills. Research skills, I won't talk too much about it because, as I mentioned, in the five steps of um, entering into the global market, research is very important. When you go, say, for example, when I speak to a presenter or a potential venue, will be working with us I research and understand, oh, so they program from August to, to March, and then the other months they rent out the venue. So if I know that the, the show can only go on when they're renting out the venue, I wouldn't put, pitch them the show. So do your research. The second thing is observation skills. Um, and this is as, as small as just listen. Um, I always think when you go and have a conversation with someone or when you're pitching things to someone, um, if you spend more time asking questions and listening more than you talk at people, you actually get a lot more because you're able to listen, adapt from what you've listened to and tweak what you're trying to pitch to the other person um, according to that other person's desires. So observe, it can be listening, it can be seeing body language, uh, are they protecting themselves, are they feeling quite good, or are they very, very interested, so observe. Communication skills, linked with observation skills, listen more, uh, but I do think language and being clear is very, very important. Uh, in your communications, do not make assumptions. Say, for example, when we say marketing and communications, I might have my own set of understanding what marketing is. But actually, if I say, for example, work in China, their understanding of marketing and also the tools for marketing will be totally different from what we are saying in the UK. Same with the word access. It can mean entering into a global market. It can mean accessibility for audiences with differing um, uh, disability or needs. So don't make assumptions when you communicate. Clarify. This is very, very important in building a solid foundation when you go working with global partners. 
Last is negotiation skills. Um, it sounds very easy. And actually, if you practice, it's easy. But I think the key to this is to understand what your priorities are, what your exit strategy is, and what you're trying to negotiate is anything in between. But remember, when you go into negotiation, it's not about you winning. It's about both party coming out thinking that you've both won. So negotiation skill is not about, I am better than you. It's about creating a joint, better future for both parties and possibly people around you. So remember the soft skill. The last bit, I'll wrap it up in a minute, um, is hard skills. And these things are things that I think are things that you need to genuinely go and learn. These might be technical skills, language skills, legal skills, and financial skills. So technical skills, you don't need, say for example, when we work in the performing arts, I don't need to learn about what five ton dynamic load in a double reef system is, but I would have to know basic things like, oh, actually this needs to go up and down. It needs something lifting. I don't need to know all the difficult calculations in physics because there will be specialists. I can go to our amazing technical director to ask, oh, so actually does that mean this calculation work? But you have to have a basic understanding of what this is. Second is language skills. Um, if there is a particular market that you're very, very interested in, um, say, for example, China, Japan, it's you can use English, but in those countries, knowing their local language does help a lot. Um, so really evaluate whether you need to pick up a new language. Third is legal skills. Um, you don't need to be a lawyer, but you need to have basic understanding of, say, for example, intellectual property rights. What is liability clauses? What is indemnity? So at least have a basic understanding of this and know what people are talking about when you're negotiating or writing, signing a contract, because these things are, would come back to bite you if you've agreed to something that you don't understand. The last bit is financial skills. So this is as simple as understanding how much you can invest, how much is coming back in, and then understanding your financial strategy of how much you can reinvest in the future. Um, be very careful in your numbers because, again, if you don't understand your own numbers, no one can help you. So I think these are some of the guiding principles, qualities, soft skills and hard skills that would help you in your global journey. Add that with a structured five-step way of entering the global market, you should be able to sort of have a more structured and clear way of um, working with international partners. And um, Thank you very much. And now I'll pass the time back to Danny for a Q&A. Thank you. Oh, I can't hear anyone right now. Quiet and silent. I'm trying to make my way back to the stage, but thank you so much for that. I feel like that was an exercise in hard skills and technical skills. Um, which is always really, really helpful. And I love that FKA was also part of the presentation as well. Um, so we're now going to take some questions from the floor. If you have questions, please raise your hand so we can get a mic to you. There's one over here. Hi. I'm spying you on Facebook Live. Can you hear me? Yep. OK. Um, I just saw your global map on where your, your global footprint in terms of traveling around the world is. I noticed that um, there's no particular place that you travel to in Africa. Is there a particular reason why? With Africa, right now what we're... Oh, sorry, Danny. Are you going to uh, get a few questions or should I answer no, them? No, I'm happy for one? you to answer them one by one. Yep, brilliant. Thanks. Um, actually, one of the reasons why we are partnering with FASA and also um, Common Purpose is that we want to understand Africa better. Africa is such a vast continent. Different countries, different cities have their own dynamic. Um, that's why I said I really would have loved to come here and learn more about 
the industry, the ecology, the people, organizations, and everyone around. So that's definitely a learning experience for us. But in terms of artists, we do work with a lot of artists from the African continent. So say, for example, um, in MIF21, we work with uh, Kamang Walahulare, we work with Gregory McComa, and some of the works, uh, including I Love You Too, which is an installation piece at the Manchester Central Library, and also uh, at a theatre dance puppetry piece called The Global Playground. So we do work in the with the African continent, but definitely an area that we want to develop more. So you have my email. Cool. Really great question, and thanks for asking it. I'm sure we have more questions. There's another question online um, on our WhatsApp number, um, which the participants can see on the screen. This is a question by Simpiwe Nyawose. You spoke about having to study the market and then implementing what you think those markets would want from you. What is missing and you can offer, or what works in those spaces? As creative, there's always a chat about selling out for commercial success, which is normally seen in a bad light. Please help clarify the importance of balancing one's artistic integrity and what is working or can potentially work internationally. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So one thing that I mentioned is authenticity. Uh, never sell out. That's very, very important because the product is yours. Your ideas are yours. You have to be true to yourself because when you're selling out, when you are doing something, ah, adapting doesn't always mean selling out. You have to understand where you as an artist, where you as uh, where the artwork that you're bringing in fit into the market. If, say, for example, there is a place that you feel actually I really do not. The, the values of that organization really do not align with me. Say, for example, they are a tobacco company. Don't go there. Don't work with them. If the values do not align, then I say don't. When I mean adapt, it means, okay, so in a certain area, um, certain ideas, are more sensitive. Ask yourself, uh, say for example, there is this work that I was discussing with an Asian presenter. Uh, in that city, um, actually homosexuality is still a sensitive topic. And I very particularly ask, is there outright censorship? And then that presenter said, yes, there is censorship. Um, but these are the guidelines. You can show same sex a couple walking down the stage, but you cannot show same-sex couple with children walking down the stage. And then I really go back to the artist and ask, so this presenter, this city has censorship. These are the guidelines. How does that sit with you? And then the artist said, actually, I understand, but I can work around that guideline. I can still show a same-sex couple walking down. Then I work around them. Understand that you need to tweak, but do not go against your value. Understand what your priorities are, your bottom line is, and then work around it. So really, really do not sell out. Authenticity is really important. Mm -hmm. Do we have more questions in the room? Okay, we have one in the front. Um, hi, my name is Jane, and I'm part of the cohort. <laughs> Um, thank you so much for investing in us, me and the rest of the cohort. Um, so I just really want to know, um, in terms of taking productions from different countries to the Manchester International Festival, how important is language? Like, are you receptive of other languages that are not necessarily English or, yeah? Yeah, I hope I'm making sense. Why do I always say that? Yes, I am making sense. You are making sense. And I can see you on Facebook Live. <laughs> um, language. Um, going back to what the festival does, and I think the essence of art um, is that it's multidisciplinary. A lot of art actually do not use spoken language. Um, I always feel, <laughs> all right, so 
I, I dated a musician um, <laughs> before, and um, he is not the best in communicating through words. And I always say, you're a musician, you're an artist, you are great in communicating in the language that you choose. It can be a musical language, it can be a choreographical language, it doesn't always have to be spoken language. And that's sort of how I understand art. And even in spoken, spoken word theatre, there are so many things to help local audiences access your work. Say, for example, subtitles, surtitles. Um, say, for example, um, you, can, you can appreciate the aesthetics of certain theatrical performance, even without understanding the text. You can watch, uh, read a, a, a blurb about it. And if you actually think about what Rafa said yesterday about accessibility and inclusivity, a spoken language is not the only language that we're using. Um, in the UK, we use British Sign Language. So open up your mind and understand what are the different languages and communications uh, and be receptive of all different forms of communication. Because I think as artists and creators, that's how you create, communicate, and actually make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much, Michelle. Thank you for that question. I think we have another one on the WhatsApp line. This question is from Zake, one of our 25 cohort members, and he asks, how is cultural intelligence of importance in working with different nations? Thank you. I think cultural intelligence is important in working not only with different nations, but working with anyone. Um, cultural intelligence, I think, feel at the end of the day is about sensitivity, it's about respect, it's about understanding and empathy. Um, and that really guides how we work and how we go around everyday life. If you understand what a certain person, a certain culture usually have, their, um, let me backtrack, I feel Cities, countries are very easily seen as one big thing, but it's very important that, to understand that the city is made up of people and it's individuals that you're working with. So that's very important. And if you look back at it, if you manage to understand respect and empathize with a certain person, use this to understand the history, certain cultural backgrounds, certain understandings and beliefs of the different places that you're going to. Adapt, be empathetic and sympathetic, and, and really try to connect in an authentic level so that you understand, ooh, say for example, a certain person came across as very blunt. Is it to do with how the language structure goes? Say, for example, in Japan, the language structure is very, very polite, very, very gentle. And so when you work with Japanese people, sometimes it would feel like, oh, they're very, very polite. But if you think about the German language, it's a, it sounds different and the structure is different. How does that affect how people come across? So having the cultural intelligence is having the understanding, empathy and sensitivity to respect all these differences um, and you can, it's a portable skill that you can take because it's not only usable in dealing with one person, dealing with one city, but you can bring it across the board. Mm -hmm. I have a question. So if people are in the room today and they're interested in being a part of Manchester International Festival, they want to connect with you, what are the portals through which people can make that move or make that approach to the festival? Do you have an open call? Can you let us know? Yep. So, <clears throat> step one of um, Glowing Global uh, research, why do you want to come to MIF? So I think first is clarify why you want to do it. The second, as I said, is network. So now you know me, you have my email address. <laughs> Um, MIF do not do open calls, um, so the way that MIF works, as I said at the beginning, we are a festival of new commissions, yeah. so we have a curatorial team who works on, with 
um, different artists to understand what are their current interests and passions. And we work together with the artists to create new works. As we move into the factory, there will be different ways of programming. So there will be the festival programming, there will be factory programming. We will also work in a, as a rental. So we're still working that out. But as a first step, as I said, networking is very important. So now you have our contact. Um, we will review things and we will pass it to the curatorial team. And we hope that one day we'll come over and see you all in person. Yeah, I know I'm definitely planning to attend. I'm very excited to. I think we have another question from our WhatsApp line. Question from Kibare. In regards to the PESEL risk factors, it's staggering. It's starting to feel like the political risks are getting so out of hand. For example, in the African continent, rampant corruption and international relation between countries getting fractured is making it harder to work continentally. What are, are there any ideas of mitigating political risk without completely giving up? Hmm. Thank you. That's a very difficult situation that a lot of places are facing. So um, as I mentioned briefly, I'm originally from Hong Kong. Um, so as you might also have heard, Hong Kong since 2019 have been ha going through a very difficult political situation. So I, I very clearly understand where you're coming from and it's something that's very close to my heart. Um, one thing that I remind myself is that um, the work you do reflect on who you are and how you understand the world. And I do believe that if I continue doing good work, I can make good changes and I'll be able to find people who share my own value. Again, going back to the point of being authentic and having joy in the work that you do. Um, and together with more people, we can make positive changes. So that's a personal sharing. And in terms of the bigger sense, um, you mentioned working continentally. Um, go back to the idea of the city, the country, the continent is made up of people who are your allies, who are the people who share your value. Um, are they also doing the same cause as you do? Can you work together? And then can you use this collective energy, this collective um, source of working together, go global, use your outside friends also an ally to affect what's happening inside. Um, tenacity, as I said, is one of the qualities that you have to have as human beings, artists, entrepreneurs. Um, being tenacious in your own values, understanding your philosophies um, and not giving up is maybe step zero in glo going global because you have to, because if not, if you give up, it's, you know, you can't do things. So find your allies because there are always people out there. Uh, break down the, the, the problems. Um, if we always think this is a huge problem, this is a huge continent and it's a huge problem that I can't solve, then you'll always feel like you're sort of stopping yourself. Break it down. What are the smaller problems that contribute to the bigger problems? Who are the individuals who can help you in solving the immediate problem? And from that immediate problem, what are the impacts that I can change and make? So I think that's my way of understanding. Be authentic, be happy, Find your allies, find your friends, get a cat. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think we have two more questions, which is three, which is probably all we have time for. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, I hope you can hear me. My name is Alice, Alice Miyama. I'm from Zambia and I'm a visual artist. Uh, my question is in relation to your, um, I think one of the words that you've really emphasized is authenticity. And I just wanted to know how open are you to uh, individuals that are self-taught like myself, uh, that are trying to create a balance between being authentic and also uh, providing great quality. So is, is, is the platform open to nurturing someone who's authentic but is not yet there in terms of the 
uh, maybe international standards when it comes to the quality, and then who provides that guideline in terms of that, quanti that, that quality that would be able to uh, will be welcomed at an international level? Thank you. That's a great, Hi, great question. <laughs> Thank okay. You. So, um, oh, sorry. Is it another question? No, I was saying let's maybe for this round, let's take all the questions and then get the answers. Thank you. Hello. Um, my name is Asake. I play a Ugandan harp um, from Uganda, um, mostly traditional African music. So, one of the challenges is packaging of your craft so that you attract or rather you appeal to a certain market, especially with going um, global. Um, most of the things you've discussed, it's mostly soft information, but the hard stuff is the financial aspect of things. So how do you best package that craft so that it, it, it arrives to the, to the right people who will, will, um, will be the means to get you there? And let's take the final question from the front. Uh, hello, guys. My name is Tabang, and I'm a muralist. And um, my question is, I've always, like, as a creative, you know, my mind kind of always goes all over the place when I'm trying to come up with an idea. And it's always bothered me, in a way, um, how the most popular businesses are always focused on like things that I can't necessarily, or I can, but like I don't want to provide, like food, for example, um, clothes, like the biggest industries in the world have already claimed the first principles of human values. And I was wondering for like a creative someone who does visual arts or paints murals or like customizes shoes, for example, are there first principles that they can look at so that they can align themselves more, um, more profitably with the market? I don't know if, that, if I put it right. No, I think it makes perfect sense. Thank you for that question. Michelle, do you have all of them? Yep, thank you. So I've got three questions, and I've seen the back of your ha heads on uh, Facebook Live. <laughs> 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 so I think, actually, the three questions do correlate to each other, because at the end of the day, you're asking about um, authenticity and the value of the work that you're creating. How do you value uh, in terms of tangible uh, 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 things like finances of the work they're doing, how do you market it to the right people, not only to buyers, uh, not only to organizations, but also to customers. Um, so I think it's, and, and also how do you create more value that goes back to the nurturing. So I think it's um, all related. Um, first off to the nurturing um, and how to authenticity and great quality. So within MIF, we have an amazing um, uh, trading for local community and people in Manchester who are interested in the arts. They're very authentic, but maybe they didn't really have the skills of what does it mean to do technical production? How does it, how does back of house work and stage? So these are some of the things that a skills and training team does. But I think actually, if you don't, you don't have to look too far away to nurture yourself. Uh, people around you can provide a lot. Um, throughout the past half a year, we've been working with Barca and Common Purpose. They create great programs that can help you understand not only hard skills, but also your soft skills, so that you understand yourself better, understand the qualities of you that you can enhance, improve, and can bring to the world. And I do think authenticity and quality do come hand in hand. If you are faking it, you're not making it. Um, so I think that comes hand in hand. Who provide the guidelines to what is good quality? 
I think it really depends on your original objective of defining quality. So there are external and internal. Uh, for you, what do you prioritize? Say, for example, if I try to understand the quality of an experience for myself, do I look at how much happiness it brings me? Do I look at how much more networks and synergies do, does it bring me? So that's your internal quality. For external quality, it really depends on the organization, the people that you work with. Say, for example, if you are a fashion designer, you would be looking at the quality of the fabric that you're looking at, um, the, the ink that you're printing things in. Um, it's a whole package. So I think um, at the end of the day, go back to enhancing your own skills and make sure that your value is aligning with what you're trying to, uh, the, the, the people that you're working with. So make sure that you stay authentic. Uh, the second question is about valuing your work and also making sure that you package your craft financially and it arrives to the right people. Um, I think there are two things to it. There's the physical packaging and there's also the packaging it so that it goes to the market in a sort of more marketing bit because I don't really know how to package a Gandan part. Um, I know uh, uh, Sorry, Great Michelle, could you just everyone. repeat the last thing that you said? Because I think we all lost it on the feed. No worries. Yeah. So what I was saying is um, packaging. So I'll focus on the software packaging more than the hardware packaging. I know freight company and cargo companies who can help with the hardware. I am not the expert on it. But in terms of packaging, um, it goes back to understanding the global market. What is the trend of the global market um, and how do you add value or respond to it. I think that's very important and that brings in your creativity. Um, say for example, if um, one of the global trends would be to understand uh, um, your local community. Um, and look at your craft look at the creation that you make, how can it respond to the local community? You might not be then going overseas and performing, you might not be going overseas and uh, selling your heart, but it might be, you will be going overseas collecting local stories to inform your own composition. Then really understand how, what you can bring to the market response. So this is how you, package your craft, I would say, because it doesn't it doesn't go away from your value. It's really about expanding what you can do and understanding what the market needs. Second thing is how do you uh, the financial packaging and getting it to the right people. As I mentioned, you have to understand your finances. How much resources do you have? How much can you invest in? What is your risk? And um, how do you price your product, service, whatever it is that you're making. Uh, market research is very important. Um, and then really look at the long time horizon. How much time can you invest in it? What is the rate of return that you're thinking about? Pull out an Excel sheet and really understand the numbers. So that's a financial packaging. And the last thing is about get, getting to the right people. Once you understand what you're trying to sell or share with the global market, you have different arenas. Say, for example, if it's a performing, uh, it's a performance, there are loads of performing arts market, like um, Australian performing arts market, Seoul performing arts market, uh, Yokohama performing art meeting. So go to these. If, say, for example, you're a visual artist, who are the galleries who can help you? If you're an online um, a uh, creator who does online distributors, apart from Etsy, eBay, what else, what other platforms are there? Do your market research. And very quickly, I know I have two more minutes, uh, I'm already over, is about um, first principles and lining them. Um, I do think uh, we should look at people holistically. So 
So it's not only about the air we breathe, the coffee you drink, and the chocolate we eat. It's about, I'm saying those because I'm craving coffee and chocolate right now. Um, <laughs> it's, be, it's about your whole total experience. I do believe that us working in the arts and creative industry, and also people in general, have moved beyond survival. Uh, it's about enhancing the quality of life. And if you are able to tell yourself or tell your target audiences, how does what you create enhance their quality of life and actually make them want more? I think that is the key to unlocking your creation into a popular business. <laughs>